Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today on how to give and receive feedback. My name is Charles Rogel, and I'll be moderating our presentation. Our presenter today is Daryl Harmon. Hello, everyone. Daryl earned a Master of Organization Behavior degree at the Marriott School of Management at Brigham Young University. He also holds several certifications and corporate training programs, including Master Trainer with Vital Smarts on programs like Crucial Conversations, Crucial Accountability, influencer training, and so on. He also has over 20 years of experience in consulting, corporate training, organizational development, coaching, and human resources, and the list goes on and on. Um, DecisionWise has been in business now for, uh, or since 1996. We specialize in conducting leadership development training, um, 360 feedback, coaching, and so this training today, or this, this presentation today, is actually a module from one of our training programs uh, we have three different uh, leadership training programs, Lead, Lap, and Management Excellence. You can see the descriptions here. But this module is um, actually overlaps in multiple training programs that we deliver quite frequently. So Daryl, I wanted to, um, I guess, allow you to explain more about your background. You've been doing training for about 20 years. About how many right. courses do you think you've delivered um, just training in general over that amount of time? Oh, a couple of, uh, two, three hundred probably. <laughs> You know, different courses, different train, types right. of training courses. Right. And sessions, do you think you've conducted? Well, yeah, a couple. So a couple hundred sessions, oh, okay. days of those. Yeah. Uh, you know, a half dozen or so different courses uh, over the course of my uh, career. And uh, what was um, one of the craziest training experiences that you think you've had? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, not too many. Uh, those are always fun, but there was one that sticks out in my mind. I was teaching a course similar to this one on, on feedback, and it was around giving people feedback and, and uh, really was around accountability. And I was doing a role play with the group at the very end as a capstone activity. After everybody had learned all the skills, then we were going to put them to use, and we were doing a little role play. And I was in the role of the recipient of the feedback. And when I got the sense when I was training a group that they were getting the skills, I liked to push them a little bit and be a bit resistant or even kind of shoot back at them. And so I was in a role play with one particular gentleman who was, I think he was the president of his company. He was a pretty powerful guy. So you picked the right guy for this I, role I did, play. I did, you know. And, and so that was, that's my, you know, <laughs> me, me having no stature whatsoever in my company, I like to pick on the big guys when I have a chance. So. Yeah. So that was my arena in which to do it. And so I was, we were doing the role play, and I thought, well, this guy is getting it, so I'm going to push him. I'm going to poke him a little bit and be resistant. Well, at a certain point, he had had enough, and he actually climbed up on his chair. So we were seated facing each other. He actually climbed up on his chair. He stood on top of the chair. On, on top of the chair <laughs> to show me how much bigger he was than I, I guess. And he pointed his finger at me and started uh, kind of swearing a blue streak. He said, Gerald, you had better, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> So that was very lively, and uh, it was a lot of fun, and it it showed the demonstrated uh, how not to do things. <laughs> so everyone in the audience is just sitting there with their mouths <laughs> wide open. <laughs> they were probably wondering what I was going to do. But for me, it was so over the top that it was comical, and I just smiled and I backed off the pressure, and and he backed down, and we had a good laugh over it. Uh, but it was it, it was interesting, and you know that comes to mind, and, it, and we're going to talk about some of those dynamics as we get into the presentation today. Because we can get thrown off our game when we're in some of these difficult uh, discussions. Great. Well, thanks, Daryl. I wanted to let everyone know before we get too much farther, this webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes. Everyone's going to be on mute. So if you have questions throughout, feel free to use the question tool and submit those. We'll try to address them as we go. We'll also leave some time at the end. This webcast has also been approved for one hour of HRCI and SHRM credit. So after the presentation, I'll give you those codes and also be sending out a follow-up email. One other thing you'll notice is there's a little tab on the, the toolbar called Handouts. The slides from today's presentation are located there, so you can download those and follow along if you'd like. Um, but otherwise, let's get moving. So the first, um, first concept we want to talk about is, you know, what, what, why feedback? What's the point in giving feedback? Right. And I'd like to begin with this fun little uh, snippet of a Robert Burns poem called To a Louse. And I'll explain the title in a minute. But let me just read it first and then maybe translate into English, he was Scottish, and he said this, and would some power the small gift give us to see ourselves as others see us? It would from many a blunder free us and foolish notions. What airs of dress and gait would leave us and even devotion? Now, let me unpack that a little bit. Uh, Robert Burns one day was sitting in church, and he saw this woman sitting in front of him, uh, adorned in very nice apparel, uh, very lovely, very clean, and he noticed a little louse, a little bug crawling on the back of her. And his first thought was, well, little louse, do you realize who you're crawling on? This is a very fine lady. 
the second thought he had was, well, lady, do you realize you have a little bug crawling on you? And so he penned these lines as he had the insight that, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody could help us see ourselves as we are seen? And so at Decision Wise, you know, we do a lot of work with 360 feedback, and that allows a person to see him or herself from various vantage points. And uh, back to the poem a little bit, you know, he says, it would from many a blunder free us and foolish notion. If we could see ourselves really clearly, more clearly than we can see ourselves just on our own, then it actually would be very helpful. We could get rid of some of the errors or some of the pretensions or some of the just misconceptions that we have about ourselves, and it could be a very productive exercise. So that's what we're going to try and do today in this webcast to give you some ideas on how to make those exchanges with each other productive. So there, we at DecisionWise pride ourselves on research-based, uh, scientifically valid feedback. So I think we want to start off this presentation with one of those uh, types of studies. We should do that. We have to come with, the, with, uh, with this group. So we have a poll question which we are going to launch here, um, which will give us some great insight into the level of reception that people have in terms of uh, giving feedback. So I've launched a poll now. You should all be able to see it. And we'd like people to participate. Take a moment to choose the best answer here for yourself. Now, I know, um, you know, telling your boss that they need to be less of a micromanager, that's kind of a common scenario we say, see a lot of times. Right. Um, we also see, um, you know, telling a coworker that their jokes are stupid. Now, I hear that one a lot, <laughs> but I don't necessarily have to well. give that to other people. Um, telling a friend that they smell or getting a root canal. So I'm going to leave this open for a little while and let you all respond. Um, all right, looks like we're getting most of the people here answering. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and then show it to the audience here. All right, now I'm sharing the results. And so what we're seeing here is that uh, most people would prefer A, 31%. Tell your boss that they need to be less of a micromanager. They feel a little safer doing that. But, you know, it's rather, um, it's rather even. You know, 27% telling a coworker that their jokes are bad, 25% uh, telling someone they smell, and 17% would rather get a root canal. <laughs> yeah, honestly. Well, and, you know, the way we phrase this, too, is which would you prefer to do? We didn't ask people how many would actually do that. Right. right? <laughs> so this is what's on our mind, and this goes to the heart of what we're going to talk about, is we have lots of things on our mind, lots of things, messages we would like to send. Mm -hmm. But if we were to ask people now, okay, how many of you would actually tell your boss, hey, back off, stop being a micromanager, the number might dip quite a bit. Sure, sure. Or if we ask the question, how many have actually done that, that would be an <laughs> interesting true. poll too. Next time. Next right. Time. All right. Right. All right. That leads us into our next discussion. Why is giving feedback so hard? So there's some very understandable reasons why it's difficult to open our mouths and tell our boss that she's being too much of a micromanager or ch tell Charles that his jokes really aren't that funny, although his really are, but <laughs> we're just pretending, right? But the first one is that we tend to go negative. And there's some dynamics there. I won't go into the full detail, but basically when somebody does something we don't like, that's the time when we'd like to give them feedback. But we have an emotional reaction to that. And that reaction, of course, is a negative one. So the fundamental attribution error that you see on your screen, that's basically the notion that when people do something we don't like, we tend to chalk it up to their poor, their bad character, their poor judgment, their, their low motivation. Personality. Yeah, their personality. We, we get personal about it. And we go negative, and so how am I supposed to tell you that not only are your jokes moronic, but of course, where do moronic jokes come from? A moronic mind. And so I don't want to tell you you're a moron because that's rather offensive, <laughs> but that's what I'm thinking. And it's all negative. So that's kind of uh, barrier number one. Okay. As opposed to what? I guess, it, so, it, and we'll talk about the fundamental right. attribution error more. I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Right. Yeah, that's the first barrier. And so the next one is, we tend to think in binary terms, good, bad, right, wrong. So if I'm committing the fundamental attribution error and I'm assuming that you're a jerk, then that's going to be, well, you're a total jerk or you're a, a, a perfectly great guy. And in, if I think you're a great guy, then I'm not going to speak up. But we think in these binary terms rather than the nuance that is the reality. Mm -hmm. And that is that you're a great guy, but your jokes, you know, are that funny. Well, and a lot of this has a compounded effect when you look, when you meet someone the first time. And that's your first experience, you know, first impression true, kind of true. set the stage for these right. ideas. Yeah, you can't, you know, you don't get a second chance to make a good first impression, as the old saying goes. So the next one then is uh, our bias increases when we're under pressure. 
And that pressure, again, is largely created by ourselves, where we've gone negative, we're frustrated. Uh, the pressure also builds when we don't speak up early, and that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later. But if you tell one joke that I think is off-color or not very funny, I might laugh or I might not, but I kind of stop that away. I don't really tell you that, gee, that wasn't very funny. I just say, oh, okay, well, you missed on that one. But then after the fifth one, now I'm like, well, this guy's a moron. <laughs> and so over time, this pressure is building, and also pressure is built because I feel guilty that I didn't, or bad that I didn't say it earlier, and now, gosh, if I come out with this at this point. So anyway. Yeah, why didn't you say building, something earlier? Yeah. yeah. Pretty big thing. Right. And then the last thing, the dynamic that we'll talk about is that we start with conclusions uh, when giving feedback, and this can create a competitive loop. And what we mean by that is that if I've already assumed that you're guilty, then my job becomes to convince you of that or convict mm -hmm. you of that. Mm -hmm. And so then when I do give you some feedback, I probably do it in an offensive way. You become defensive, and then I'm seeing this resistance to my feedback, and I say, well, no, 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 you're not getting it. I'm the one who's right. You're the one who's wrong. Right. And we get this competitive loop where I'm pushing and you're pushing back, and it just gets ugly. Spirals downward. It does. It can really create a downward spiral. So to combat that, we want to get clear, first of all, on the role of each person in the interaction. The role of the giver, the role of the receiver. And the first thing, as givers of feedback, what we want to do is have a mindset of motivating the other person to improve and to guide them. And what I mean by that is I want to frame my message in a way that's helpful for the other person. So if I think that your um, a personal aroma is too strong, I'm not just going to say you stink or you wear too much cologne. I'm going to try and motivate you to change and guide you by pointing out, well, here's maybe what you should do instead. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to be pushy about it, but I'm going to be clear about that. So as a giver of feedback, that's what I want to come into the exchange with is this mindset, this heart set, if you will, really of wanting to motivate and wanting to guide you toward better behavior, better outcomes. Yeah, because you're really, your, your end goal is the outcome. What do you want to be that's right. different now? That's right. Now, that's an important point, Charles, because if my goal, and I have to check myself, because if my goal is just to vent, mm -hmm. because, again, if that pressure builds up, then I reach my breaking point, and I just want to blurt it out and say, stop with the stupid jokes or enough with the cologne, then, then my motive there is really to vent and to help myself. If I come into that exchange really just wanting to vent and serve myself, then no wonder that you're not going to be all that interested in my feedback. Sure. So I have to make sure I have a good motive. On the other side, then, if I'm a recipient of feedback, I want to learn. I want to improve. And sometimes learning can be no more than learning what other people expect of me, how other people see me. And the reason I say that is because sometimes we have the misconception as recipients of feedback that, well, you know, if you tell me that, then I can either reject it or I have to accept it hook, line, and sinker. And it's not, I don't think it's quite that black and white. Again, we're thinking in binary terms. I might say, okay, I, I hear you, and I'm going to take from that what I choose to take from it, what I think is most beneficial. So I want to learn something, and I want to improve myself. So feedback really is a gift. No matter how badly it might be wrapped, it's still a gift because you can learn from it. So with these two mindsets, then, let's talk a little bit about the dynamics, uh, kind of the energy that's created in the exchange. And there's a bit of a roller coaster ride that we might go on. And one of the reasons I'm sharing this is because you need to understand when you go into an exchange with somebody, when you go to give somebody feedback, for example, it might be a little bumpy before it smooths out. Mm -hmm. And so just know that. Know that, number one, it might get a little bumpy, so hang in there. Because a lot of times we get bucked off early on when we get that first bit of resistance from someone. And so you want to hang in there. So this, uh, you can see the energy roller coaster, right? And there are different phases. The SARA is a nice acronym for the journey to hope. Now, we don't start with hope. We kind of end with it. That's yeah. the H. <laughs> the first phase that we might hit is shock, where, you know, you come to me and you say, well, Daryl, you know that webinar could have been better. Think, <laughs> really? What? I thought I was pretty spectacular. <laughs> and so I might be shocked at first. I might essentially be saying, what? Did, did I hear you? Are you kidding? I don't think so. So if that's the reaction you get from somebody when you first give them feedback, don't be thrown off. Just understand that they may have an emotional reaction to it initially. Yeah. From the shock then, the next phase is anger. So once they processed it a little bit cognitively, they might say, no, no, wait, wait, wait. 
no way. Obviously, you don't get what I was going for, right? That joke was hilarious. You were just too <laughs> sensitive. And so I might be a little angry at you for your feedback. And if that's the case, again, if you get that initially, don't get bucked off. Hang in there with them. And I'll say more about how to do that, but the short version is, and we've already mentioned it, if you've got a good motive for giving the feedback, then that can help you stay the course. So the next phase then after anger could be some resistance. Mm -hmm. So they're not really open to the feedback. They're like, okay, you know, I get it, but I don't buy it. it you're mistaken. Uh, this doesn't apply to me. You're, you're, you're up in the night. So if you see that, actually kind of be happy because this is the last phase of resistance really that you're going to get, which is resistance. So the shock, the anger, the resistance. These Sometimes are, they, they, people shut down, right? They go yeah, silent in a yeah. way or, or you know, it's one of those defensive mechanisms. They're protecting their ego. It's a good point because resistance can take the form of fight or flight. Okay. Right? Or, or even freeze. It's just like, okay, okay, sure, whatever. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Right? So if you're seeing that, understand these first three phases really are an emotional reaction to the feedback. And people have to go through this, some sort of emotional reaction, in order then to be able to cognitively process what you're telling them with the feedback. So if you see this, don't get thrown off. Just say, okay, they're, they're processing this emotionally. Once they get past the emotions, then they can hear what I'm saying. And so that leads us to the next phase, the next uh, step really, which is acceptance. So once I've had a chance to kind of work through this emotionally, calm myself down, then I can say, okay, okay, L let me hear what you're actually saying, Charles. Let me consider what you're saying. And maybe there's something I could do with it. At this point, then, things really start to accelerate in a positive direction. And that's where we get to hope. Okay, hey, actually, this might work out. You know, maybe you've got some insights that I hadn't considered. And this, this could be a good thing. So I think, I guess there's two things here. One is, you know, there, there's going to be some emotion on your part when you're giving feedback because obviously it bothers you or makes you upset or something like that. Exactly. And I think we're kind of blinded to the fact that the other person won't have emotion. Yeah. Right? We, 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 you know, anticipate that they won't, that they need to be hearing our emotion instead of processing their own. It's a wonderful insight, wonderful point you make because if you think about it, we've kind of gone through the Sarah model ourselves with respect to the other person's behavior. Yeah. So we were at first shocked and then angry about it. Uh -huh. And like, you know, resistant, that comes in like the accusatory phase where we're like, oh, no, that cannot happen. Yeah. And then we're like, all right, well, listen. And maybe even the resistance is my resistance to giving you feedback. Mm -hmm. And then I say, all right, listen, I, you know, somebody's got to speak up. And so I accept that. So there can be some parallels. But the point I'm making here is that I've already gone through this. And when I first hit you with my feedback, you know, I have to give you time to go through it as well. And, you know, sometimes this happens in a matter of minutes. Sometimes it's a couple of different sessions. Uh, you know, it may take a little while. It just depends on how strongly the person is being, uh, being affected by this emotionally. And, again, later on in the, in the presentation, we'll talk about how to minimize the chances that somebody will go through wild swings emotionally. Yeah. Minimize the defense. Well, sometimes you see it happen where you feel like they're not, um, you know, they're, they're in that emotional state still, and they're really bothered by it. They're not ready to make any changes. Right. But then the next day you talk to them or see them, and they've changed their behavior already. Yeah. You know, so so yeah. They've, they've kind of gone through it all overnight, and now they've changed. Maybe they're still a little angry about yeah. it um, or resentful for it, but they've changed. But So there's some cleanup work probably to do after that. You know, it's another good point that we don't always have to hold their hand all the way through this. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that in a bad way, hold their hand. But sometimes they just need time to process themselves. But you're right. If you haven't really come to resolution on everything in the conversation, you give them time to think through it and cool down, then we can revisit it and go back through. And, and again, we'll get into some steps on what to do and uh, where that will make even more sense. Okay. All right, so some best practices around giving feedback. Uh, I'm going to go through these at a high level and kind of briefly, but we'll revisit each of these in a little more detail as we go. The first one is to give context. So if I come to you and just say, listen, Mr. Jokester, you're not that funny. <laughs> you're going to say, uh, excuse me? <laughs> right? First of all, it's pretty offensive. Right. But I'm, not, I'm kind of hitting you out of the blue. Sure. So if instead I give some context, and maybe I'm going to shift from your humor because I think it's fine. But it's a <laughs> I know, being self-conscious so now. <laughs> That's right, I know. I don't want to keep beating you up. <laughs> but let's suppose that we had a team meeting and you gave a presentation and there was a graphic you used that I thought mm, didn't go over very well. Let's just put it that way. So the first thing I'm going to do is sit down and give you some context. I'm going to say, you know, Charles, uh, I noticed something in the team meeting and in your presentation 
that I'd like to discuss. Something I think that maybe can be helpful. And so the first step is just to give the person some context around, you know, what are we talking about and maybe even a little bit about why we're talking about this. So that's the first step. The second step then is to express your good intentions. And as I just said, you know, I may sit sit uh, down with you or approach you and say, I noticed something and I've got some ideas about how to make that go even better next time. Mm -hmm. So once again, I mentioned this earlier, I, I need to have good intentions in order for this to go well. And then if I do have good intentions, then I want to express those up front so that you don't feel attacked. Because if I come to you and just say, hey, Charles, I have some feedback for you, you know, what's your first thought there? Uh-oh. <laughs> exactly. What I do now. And that's everybody's Again? first thought. Yeah. <laughs> You know, what, you know, what's lurking in the bushes? What's going to jump out at me out of the shadows? So I'm going to give a little context, give you a little heads up, express my good intentions. I'm not here to attack you. And, of course, again, this presupposes having good intentions. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later about how to create those. But then the next step is where I can actually give you the feedback. So once I've set the context, uh, express my good intentions, then I can share my perspective. And I may say, you know, the graphic on one of the slides that you used, uh, I noticed that when you showed it, I looked around the room and several people kind of looked uncomfortable. A few people left kind of nervously. And in fact, I even saw one person kind of hide her face in her hands. And so I, I noticed these things and, I, you know, it seems like that graphic put some people off. Mm -hmm. So I set the stage for this. I've expressed it to you in positive and clear terms. That's one of the mistakes that people make is beating around the bush and saying, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder if we should all take a presentations class because, you know, we all could get better. Right, right. <laughs> well, then, you know, then in your mind, you might be thinking, yeah, the rest of you yeah. need that because... Daryl, you definitely need that. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, you might be thinking that and that, and maybe I do, but that's beside the point. That's a, that's a different conversation. <laughs> this conversation is about how you could improve your sure. presentation. So I want to be clear about it. And setting the context, you know, setting the stage for it allows me to be more candid with you and explain that. Now, once I've shared my perspective, which really is a combination of my observations and my conclusions about that, then I'm going to ask for your side of it. So I may say something or ask something like, well, did you notice people getting you know, uneasy when you showed that slide? Or what were you trying to go for with that slide? What was your intent in using mm -hmm. that? So what I'm trying to do, I'm not playing games with you. I'm not trying to be slick and say, well, you really need to knock it off. I'm really trying to understand because I want to enter into a dialogue with you about what happened and what should happen from here. And so this very much is a partnership. I'm not attacking you. I'm attacking a problem with you. And so I need to get you involved in that. So that's why I'm going to take this approach. So uh, this is a little bit different than corrective action. Well, it can be corrective action. Okay. Um, so you're late for work. Yeah. Uh, and so kind of explain that scenario. In, right. In and so if that were to happen, I could sit down with you and say, you know, Charles, I noticed something over the past month. They were, and we're getting actually a little bit of ahead of ourselves, but that's okay. okay. Um, because we'll get into some of the details. But I might sit down and say, you know, I noticed over the past month you've been anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes late three times this past month. Mm -hmm. And it started to concern me. And my concern is, you know, I, I'm worried if there's something distracting you from your job. I'm concerned about the example it's setting to other people because I've noticed, you know, a couple of other coworkers are starting to come in late too. So I'm sitting down and I'm talking about the problem. And the problem is not you. It's not your character. It's not even your behavior. The problem is the impact that your behavior is having okay. on things I care about, on yeah. the productivity on our <laughs> team, et cetera. So that's my perspective. But then what I want to do is get you involved in the conversation in a very real way by saying, so help me understand what's going on. Right? Why, what's been keeping you from getting to work on time? And then we're going to deal with whatever that is. I mean, if you're bored with your job and you just don't look forward to coming to work, or if you've had a change in your daycare setup, you know, I want to get down to the reasons why you're doing what you're doing because that, that's the way we can then change it if sure. we understand the roots of that. Okay. So then we decide what to do. And I say we because I may say something like, once I understand what's going on, then I can say, all right, well, what do you think would be the best way to turn this around? Get your ideas on it and then share my own ideas and together we decide what to do because once again, a, a collaborative approach will lead to better outcomes because here's the thing. I have a concern, but you're in control of that because the concern is the impact that your behavior is having. You control your behavior. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I could threaten you. I could write you up. You know, maybe that would work. 
but I'd rather try and get you to come to the same conclusion I have. And that has to be honest. It can't be I'm using Jedi mind tricks and I'm sure. tricking you. But if we discuss this together, very often people say, yeah, okay, I guess I, I hadn't thought of it that way. Um, that's why I'm sharing my perspective because you may not realize that you're having this impact on other people. And then we talk about it together and you say, okay, I get it. And then I'm listening to you about the reasons of why you're doing it. And, you know, I get it. I, I treat you as a decent person. Nevertheless, the problem needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. So we decide that together. And then the last step in this process is to follow up. And, you know, so I may say, we may talk through this whole thing. We may understand what's keeping you from getting to work on time. And then I'll say, you know what? I'll check in with you in a couple of weeks. We'll see how things are going or whatever it might be. So, um, so one of the, the poor practices, um, maybe explain the difference or, or how this um, is different than, uh, you know, sandwiching feedback. Right. Yeah. The common sandwiching practice. Sandwiching feedback <laughs> is really this, the way to sneak up on somebody and stab them in the back without them really realizing it. Sure. Although they do. That's yeah. the problem with it. So the sandwiching is saying something nice. Hey, I really appreciate your hard work. You're a valued employee. And by the way, you know, you're lazy and a slacker because you don't come to work on time. Uh -huh. And by the way, those are really nice shoes. <laughs> you know, I'm reaching for something insincere. And that's the problem is that people see through it. They see that it's insincere and it backfires, frankly, because it destroys trust. And if, if I'm getting feedback from you and I don't trust you, then I start to commit the fundamental attribution error. And I say, oh, this guy's just some slick, sly right. weasel. And so I'm just going to ignore it. Well, it goes back to intentions, right? They, right. they recognize right. Some, some hidden agenda going on. Exactly. So here's some skills to use, uh, a, a way to approach this, to give positive feedback. And this is the easy stuff. So we're going to start with the easy stuff um, because this is an often overlooked area of giving feedback. As we've been talking about this, typically when we think of giving feedback, it's around um, you know, things that we want people to change, which is legitimate, and we'll get to that. But this uh, approach will help us give positive feedback in a very productive way. Um, you know, we give people high fives and say, hey, good job, way to go, and that's fine. But there's a little more to it that could be even more helpful. Sure. And I found as I've trained this, actually, managers really appreciate this. Um, it's not rocket science. In fact, it's good social science. But five simple steps for giving positive feedback. The first one is to be very specific. So rather than saying, hey, good job, you can say, Hey, good presentation. Even that's a little vague, but I might say, you know what, Charles, that was a great presentation. I saw how people were informed. I saw people motivated to do things about it. And so being very specific about what the person did helps them understand, well, feel your sincerity, understand that you were watching, and that you were analyzing. Mm -hmm. And so this is why, you know, th this, is, this is what you saw. The next step then is to keep it all good. If this is positive feedback, don't use the sandwich technique. Don't say, hey, it was a great presentation, but. except, <laughs> yeah, the big but that yeah. you stick in there. Don't do that. If you need to cover that, do it in a separate session. But when you're giving positive feedback, don't give any qualifications. Um, you don't have to gush, but you can just say, hey, this was good. So keep it all positive. The next thing, then, is to talk about the impact. And I hinted at that a minute ago. You know, if you gave a good presentation, what was the impact? I saw people motivated. I saw people taking notes. I saw people taking action steps based on that. This then uh, explains why I think this is a good thing. And of course, all of this is, has a couple of effects. The first one is to know that you're appreciated and you feel good about that. Mm -hmm. It's also to reinforce what I believe is good behavior. So as your, as your leader, I want to point out the good things. It's the old notion of catching people doing something good. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not just a feel good uh, effect. It also has a, the effect of reinforcing good behavior. So the next step then is do it soon after the event. Keep yeah. it current, right? Because if I say, you remember that presentation you gave back in 97? <laughs> you're like, 97, where was I in that, right? Yeah, that was a good year for me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I don't remember that. For, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But, you know, do it quickly. And then um, also, in addition to the impact, reinforce the good behaviors uh, or the, the effort that went into it, the good behaviors. And so I may say, you know, I noticed that you worked on that presentation for a long time. You'd ask me for feedback. You'd ask other people. You know, and you worked hard at it, and it paid off. Now, there's some really interesting research behind this that I'll hit on very briefly, but uh, a, a professor at Stanford named Carol Dweck has done some interesting work on a, on a growth mindset and a um, fixed mindset mm -hmm. that she calls them in children. And as we reinforce our kids' good behavior, 
we can unintentionally make the mistake of reinforcing their success rather than their effort. Mm. And she's found, and this I'm being pretty brief about this, but what she has found is that the kids that you tell, you know, your third grader comes home from uh, school and she she got 100% on her math homework, and you say, "Wow, honey, you are so smart. You are so good at math. That's fantastic." Well, that sounds great. The problem is, she goes on next year to fourth grade math. It gets a little bit harder. And if you've reinforced how smart she is, how good she is at math, and then she starts to fail at things, now she starts to reconsider your feedback <laughs> and maybe even the source. Like, yeah. Well, Dad doesn't really know because I'm starting to fail at math. Versus if I were to say, wow, look at you. You've got 100% or 80% on your math. I know you worked really hard at that. What then we start to in, instill in our, in our kids and each other is that I really value the effort. And you know what? When you come up against challenges, you're a hard worker. And hard workers can tackle those challenges. They don't have to succeed the first time. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different mindset. And that's where uh, this element comes, so reinforcing the effort. Now, I mentioned this earlier. How do we create the right motive? Um, I love what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, he has the right to criticize who has a heart to help. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying here really is that if I want to give you some feedback and I want it to go well, then I have to want to help you. So if I'm at the point where I'm just ready to blow up and I'm just wanting to vent, it's not going to go well, as we talked about already. So instead, I have to say, all right, how do I help you, Charles, to give better presentations or tell better jokes or whatever? In order to do this, I'm going to ask myself some questions. The first one is, well, what would make me do that? You know, if I were in your shoes, why would I have picked that graphic? Or why would I have said that, told that joke? And try and get sympathetic, or at least empathetic, or rather empathetic, where I'm trying to understand. And usually there's a rational reason that someone had. At least right? in their mind. Yeah, exactly. At least in their mind. And so I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And that's essentially what we're talking about here is assuming good intention. Now, I want to be clear. This is not letting people off the hook. This is just saying, all right, this is a... You know, a decent guy, he's got a brain in his head that typically works. <laughs> Why, where, you know, where does that come from? Yeah. And so I'm going to ask that. Now, what this does is it puts me in your shoes. And again, I may not agree with it. I don't have to agree with it. But what I'm doing is I'm humanizing you rather than vilifying you. The second question I'm going to ask is, all right, so how does this behavior harm the other person? <laughs> in other words, the impact. And we've talked about that already. So how is this harming you? So in other words, when you told that, what you thought was a funny joke, nobody laughed or people got nervous, actually that's hurting your credibility with other people. Yeah. Or you have that graphic on that one slide, people got uncomfortable about it, that actually undermined the, the, uh, the power of your presentation mm -hmm. and it really distracted people from what you were trying to say. So I like to think when I'm giving feedback, I like to think of myself as a coach. So if I'm on your side, I'm in your corner, and I'm trying to help, I'm going to be candid with you about the things I think are hurting you. This isn't me, you know, grinding my axe. This is me helping you, pointing out things that you're not seeing. Okay. So the last one then is really to check on my own uh, feedback. You know, how will my feedback help? Once again, this is going to keep me from just criticizing you, but it's going to help me guide you instead. So we talked about the role of the giver being motivate and guide. So these are the questions that can help me get in that state. And in essence, you're really trying to say, what what is it? If this ends well, how is it going to look? Yeah. Right? So so how? what's a good experience out of this yeah. conversation? Yeah. And that's really what we want. And again, if we have that kind of mindset, heart set going into giving somebody feedback, it typically will go well. It typically will not blow up. Even if the feedback is painful, they understand that you're on their side. In fact, I do this all the time in debriefing 360 reports mm -hmm. um, where, you know, if the numbers are low and people are saying you're not that good at your job, I'm in your corner saying, okay, well, let's take a look at this. We won't back away from the bad news. But I'm not here to criticize you. I'm not going to beat you up with the feedback. I'm going to actually try and help by saying, all right, here's what people are saying. And this is something I typically tell people about 360 reports. This is good to know, right? People are thinking this already. Better that you know it so you can deal with it. It's the same thing with giving feedback. If I know something you know, about what other people are thinking about you, it's better that you know it. It's just the way I deliver it that will make a big difference. So if my heart's in the right place and my mouth is more or less in the right place, then you know things will tend to go well. Sure. 
So here's some skills now to actually say, to actually tell, you know, tell somebody, give them a tough message. And I've, I formulated this in the form of this acronym, say it, you can kind of tell I like acronyms. You yeah. Know, spice for the good stuff, say it for the hard stuff. And these are the steps, and I've covered them already a little bit, but let me go through them in a little bit of detail. So say it stands for start objectively, just the facts. Mm -hmm. So in other words, as I said earlier, you know, uh, you gave that presentation in the last team meeting yesterday, right? It's timely, it's current. And I've got some ideas uh, around um, how that went over and maybe how to make it even better next time. So I'm going to start objectively with what happened. So let me ask you, how do you, um, how do you dance around the issue <laughs> where you're the messenger and everyone else is giving you this yeah. feedback? And, you know, because the tendency is when you start saying, well, other people feel this way, Good point. people get defensive and they start wanting to verify your facts right. and who said that, Give what is right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. And so, um, you know, without throwing people under the bus, how do you um, handle that situation? It's a wonderful question. Really, the way you want to use kind of the crowdsourcing or the data that you've gathered is, again, not to beat up the other person, mm -hmm. but to say, you know, not only did I notice it, but other people made some comments. And in a, in a, in a way, I'm becoming your informant. I'm helping you see what you're not seeing, mm -hmm. hear what you haven't heard. And so again, if my heart's in the right place, I'm trying to help. I don't use everybody else's opinion to either throw them under the bus or to gang up on you and say, well, everybody thinks you're an idiot. I went around and talked to everybody <laughs> afterwards, and I got a list. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, that obviously would put you on the defensive and things wouldn't go well. Sure. So once again, we're going to start with we'll start objectively. Here's what actually happened. Then we're going to add our perspective. And again, we, we mentioned this earlier with the arrow model, that now I'm going to say, now here's what I saw, here's what I heard, and here's what I'm making of it. Mm -hmm. You know, It seems like when you showed that graphic, people got distracted uh, from your real message. They got embarrassed. And some people got embarrassed. Some people were offended. And, <clears throat> you know, of course, that's not what I want for you, uh, to happen for you. Uh, but that's what I saw. That's what I heard, and this is what I'm thinking about it. And then the next step is to invite other, uh, other facts and perspective. And again, we've already talked about this, but this is where then I say, so is that what you were going for? Did you notice the same thing? Or what were you trying to convey with that, with that graphic? And once again, then we entered into this dialogue where we talked about what happened. In the process, what's happening is a couple of things at a cognitive and a, an emotional level. At the cognitive level, we're talking about the relevant issue. At an emotional level, you're seeing me as your partner, right? You're, you're, I mean, maybe your coach, but just really your ally. And so that you're sensing because I'm not beating you up, but also it's, a, uh, it's respectful. It's showing my respect for you to actually bring it up. You know, most people I talk to when we kind of broach this issue about, well, do you want to know, do you not? People say, no, I wish people would tell me what's, what's going on. No. We don't want to have blind spots. And yet we do have blind spots. So that's where feedback can be very helpful to say, well, here's a blind spot I think you have. No, no fault of your own, necessarily. Right? I'm not attacking your character. I'm just yeah. saying, here's something you probably didn't realize or didn't hear. And so together, let's talk about that. And then together, decide what to do. So I might say, you know, after I understand why you use that graphic, what you're trying to go for, then I might say, well, is there another way to do that? Right? Or, or maybe it's a perfect graphic, but you need to set it up a little bit better. People were taken aback. They were taken by surprise. And so next time you might say, well, you know, I need to show people this. I know it was graphic, but, you know, I'm going for this effect. And, yeah, it didn't get that effect, but is there something different we can do? Okay. So now we're changing gears and to the second half of the presentation, which is receiving feedback, which okay. is sometimes uh, more difficult for some than getting feedback. You could. Because, equally. Yeah, you know, and one of the dynamics there is that we're not in charge or we're not in control. Right? When I am giving you feedback, I'm setting the agenda, kind of setting the stage, I'm, I'm driving it. But you, on the other hand, you're like, oh, what's this about? Well, and yeah, there's a sense of surprise you're not ready for. You haven't right. had a chance to process it all. So hopefully, you know, people will use these skills, the, the, the say it skills, and, and have it in their heart in the right place so that it's easy to take the feedback. Mm -hmm. But there are things that we can do, even if they don't. Okay. Like I said, feedback's a gift, even if it's poorly wrapped. Now, the barriers to receiving feedback really go to, and you mentioned this term earlier, they're ego defenses. Yeah. They're things where we're trying to preserve our own dignity, our own sense of self, and these are pretty typical. And so we want to be aware of them so that we don't invoke them and become defensiveness, defensive. rather. Yeah. So the first one is naive realism, and that's the assumption that we see things as they really are. We see the world as it is, 
and others see it that same way because it's there's an objective world out there. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you know, we see things the same way. And when you give me feedback that's different from that, I'm shocked about that. Like, what world what? are you coming from? Yeah, what? exactly. <laughs> so then I can, in my own mind at least, and maybe sometimes with my mouth, I turn it back on you and say, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. You're crazy. But that's coming from my own ego defensiveness, and it's rooted in this naive realism. The next one then is just a self-serving bias, where once again I'm trying to protect my sense of self, my own dignity, and it's the tendency to put my own spin on my success or on the feedback, explain away or justify the bad news. So, you know, if I were the one in the scenario about giving a presentation that had a, a questionable graphic on one of the slides, I might say, well, yeah, but I mean, it was a great presentation, right? And it was just one slide, and it was just one graphic. I mean, that's what's the big deal? See, I'm being defensive. I'm not open to your suggestions. I'm not even open to the idea I need to change. And of course, if I'm not, then I won't. The problem then is, if I don't change, what's going to happen the next time I show that kind of graphic? Or maybe not that one, but another one equally objectionable. What kind of reputation am I going to get? Mm -hmm. So these ego defenses don't help me. And so we need, to, we need to battle those. We need to take them down. The final one is really the opposite of the self-serving bias. It's the negativity bias. That's the tendency to focus all the attention on the negative feedback. And so I go overboard. Mm -hmm. And I become, I really crawl into my little shell and I say, oh, are you kidding? Really? People hate my guts now. They don't they want to fire me. They, holy cow. That's, and that's not helpful either. Because I won't, again, I won't be open to the dialogue that you want to initiate with me to how do we fix this? How do we preserve this? And so we want to really be more self-aware than self-deceived. And these ego defenses get in our way of doing it. So understanding that, then, is the basis for us to receiving feedback. So here's some best practices. And, and these are similar to what we use for giving feedback. Adopt an attitude of curiosity. So on the giving side, we're adopting an attitude of helpfulness. On this side, we're going to adopt an attitude of curiosity. Huh. I wonder why people thought that. I wonder what people think of me. Mm -hmm. Let me just get curious about it. I don't have to own it, necessarily. But I do want to know it because, again, when we went back to our roles slide, what we talked about there on the receiving side was that a recipient of feedback wants to learn, wants to improve. And if we adopt that mindset, then that's going to open us up to any kind of feedback. And for me, I, you know, I can be open to feedback so long as I feel like I can reserve the right to do with it as I please. Okay. And it doesn't mean just reject it if I don't like it. Mm -hmm. But it gives me the control of not being controlled, of not saying, okay, I have to do what you're saying, but I do want to understand. Because once again, if I don't, if I shut off your feedback, then I'm shutting myself off from ways to improve. So adopting an attitude of curiosity, um, asking only clarifying questions. And what I'm emphasizing there is a lot of times we have a tendency to ask justifying questions. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but didn't you say, but, but don't you, but, right? And it's the but, 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 but if, or but what about. When, when I do that, if you're trying to give me feedback and you're going out on, on a limb a little bit here and you're trying to create some safety for me and I start asking pushback questions or justification questions, what goes through your mind? The message isn't getting through yeah. or they're getting defensive right. or you start stumbling and trying to think of all So you get down that road where you're adding in other people's feedback and it just opens up platforms. Right. And, and what am I suggesting to you about your credibility and our relationship yeah, that you don't that you don't believe it. That right. you, your intentions are wrong. Yeah. And sometimes the, it's it's the defensiveness um, comes back in terms of someone feeling like they're now being accused and right. being questioned, and their opinion is invalid, and so you get defensive again. Yeah, great point. Because then what happens in the moment is we start to strain the re I start to strain the relationship. You start feeling unappreciated. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe even bad, guilty. I'm trying to do you a favor here. Exactly, and I'm <laughs> kind of throwing it back at you. Yeah. What's going to happen next time I tell an off-color joke or show a, you know, uh, an offensive graphic? Are you going to come talk to me? No way. No Done. Way. Good luck. That's it, exactly. And in fact, and what's, I don't want to get too, too far down this path, but in fact, if that were to happen, I'm essentially putting a cork in the bottle. Uh -huh. And what happens then if I keep going down this path, if you don't really feel like you have a way to talk to me, it starts bottling up in you. Daryl, I have this open door policy <laughs> in the office. Right. Anyone is welcome to come in and talk yeah. to you. Yeah. That's fine to say, but we really, you know, where the rubber meets the road is how do you respond to the feedback you're getting? Do people really feel 
open. Like yeah. they can be open. Like you really do have an open door. You might have a physically open door, but do you have an emotionally and intellectual open door? And if you don't, it sends the message that don't come tell me anything. So how does this work um, with someone who's not good at giving feedback? You're getting someone that's coming in and now venting right. to you, and they obviously want retribution, and you right, know, they're right. just really angry about what, what you did or what happened, and, um, and you're trying to process it. It's a wonderful question because that's more typical, isn't it, rather yeah. than somebody being very skilled at this. Uh -huh. So I think the, the key here then is to understand or try to hear what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. And understand, again, with the Sarah model, understand that somebody may be coming to me uh, very frustrated, and this may have been bottled up for a while, and so what I'm going to try and do is listen past the emotion, understand that they're going through this frustration, and I've seen this, it's a really powerful diffuser. If I give you some air, some air time, mm -hmm. to tell me what's on your mind, to tell me what you've heard from others, and I'm not getting offended, I'm not taking the bait, I'm not getting ego, ego defensive, but I'm saying, okay, what's Charles really trying to tell me here? Okay, I did something that people were offended by. And if I really do have an attitude of wanting to understand and learn, then I, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Because I don't feel attacked. This isn't about me. This is about the feedback. Even if they're, even if you're getting, you know, and Daryl, if you do that again, you're going to get fired. Now that might really ratchet things up, but sure. I'm going to say, okay, you're really frustrated. That's what I'm going to hear. Well, and, and there's a lot of piling on, right? So right. it's not just right. your presentation. It was yeah. Two weeks ago, one month ago, and even last year, yep. all these things are, are on the table. Again. It's a really good point. So then we just ratchet that down and say, all right, there's a whole lot on here. I don't need to take the whole, you know, the whole message here or the whole pie. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of foam on top, and so this has been building up. So just understanding mm -hmm. something about these dynamics that we've talked about will help me hear what you're trying to say. And so, once again, we go back to our skills here, asking clarifying questions then. Well, did you see, have you seen that before, or who did you talk to? Well, maybe not who did you talk to, you don't want to help people. But how many people you know, feel the same way? And then if I summarize what I've heard, I'm telling you, I'm tracking with you, I'm listening. And if I summarize also, I maybe, maybe I didn't hear everything, but mm -hmm. I might say, okay, so Charles, you're saying that I really offended people with that joke, and you know, I, frankly, I didn't mean to, but you're telling me that people did, they took it a certain way, that's useful information for me. So I'm trying to find, you know, the kernel of, of useful truth in there for me. And once again, this is, I mean, feedback really is about me improving my results, my behavior that produces my results, and you're the messenger. So I'm not going to shoot the messenger. I'm going to try and take the message, take from it what I can use valuably. And so that's the last one is committing or commit to considering the feedback. So, you know, in the moment, I might be taken aback a little bit, and I might say, wow, wow, wow. I didn't realize that it came across that way. I'm going to have to think about this. Yeah, give me some time to process. Yeah. And so that's where the, the asking clarifying questions and summarizing what you heard may be iterative. Because when you've been brave enough to come tell me, I want to take advantage of that opportunity and really hear you out. And then I can take some time if I need to to process and say, all right, well, let me consider that. And I may come back to you and say, can we revisit that a little bit? So I'm, I have some questions now. I'm wondering if this, and I'm wondering if that. Yeah. So I can even, uh, on the recipient end, um, be a little bit of the driver of this process. So if you're not skilled, then I can use some skill. And knowing the be better ways to give feedback, I might kind of guide the process. Well, especially if you're feeling caught off guard and unprepared yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and not ready. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, most of us would naturally just get defensive and try and shut down the conversation right there because it's painful, it's awkward, and I don't want to be attacked. Yeah. That's very natural, but it's not very helpful. That's the problem. So engaging in these practices and using these principles will help us then be, uh, get into a more productive space. So here are just some, some verbiage that you can use to accept feedback. You know, so tell me more. Help me understand what you mean by such and such. Can you give me an example so I can picture what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. So I, what I'm trying to do, now this also is not only helpful for me, it's helpful for you. Because when we get frustrated, angry, upset, when we have a strong emotional reaction, the thinking part of our brain tends to shut down. And we're, we're just like blurting things out. And so if I ask you these open-ended questions like help me understand, tell me what you mean, or can you give me an example, it then forces your brain to start thinking through in more detail. And quite frankly, let's suppose on the extreme I feel like you come to me with feedback that's unwarranted, that's unfair, it's inaccurate. Mm 
overblown. Yeah, overblown. What I'm going to do here is very gently push back on you and say, well, kind of prove it to me. Tell me what your evidence is. Can you give me an example of what you're talking about? And that also helps me because I'm, it may be one thing. I may have said one word the wrong way, and now you're all up in arms about it. If I understand that this was one word, or is this a, you know, the latest in a series of things I've done? The straw that broke the camel's exactly. back. Exactly. So it helps both of us to ask these questions. I get more clarity around what you mean, and frankly, you might get more clarity around what you mean because I'm asking you to give me specifics yeah. rather than just take it at face value. Uh, and then these other questions as well. So do you have any additional thoughts on this, or what do you think I could do? That, those questions are designed to um, get you to be my partner, just not just my accuser, not just the messenger, but really my partner in figuring out where do I go from here. And again, this sends another long-term, a positive long-term message that when you bring feedback to me, I'm going to be open to it, but I'm also going to engage you, and I'm going to get your thinking on it. So likely, then, the next time you bring feedback to me, or two or three times, once you learn that about me, then you're going to prepare, aren't you? Mm -hmm. You're going to think, okay, I'm going to tell this to him. He's going to listen, but then he's going to ask my opinion, and he's going to ask for some examples. So Well, and then you're, you're, you're basically engaging the person on helping you. Right? Exactly. So the, and they didn't realize they were going to commit to that. That's right. They're like, wait a minute, I don't want to get That's involved. That's what I mean about being able to control this in a good way. Yeah. That I'm not going to let you off the hook of just dumping on me and running. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, no, okay, you brought this. No, I, I want a little, you know, uh, little skin in the game as well. Sure. And I want you to give me your best thinking. And if you don't have anything, okay. But just understand, that's the deal. When you come to me with feedback, I'm not going to let you get away with just dumping and running. Mm -hmm. Or just throwing out things that are uns unsubstantiated. And that, once again, though, can be very helpful, uh, mutually helpful, because it helps me then get good feedback, real feedback, and it helps us in the long term in our relationship to know that we can talk about tough things, and there may not be anything you know, off the table. So those are the skills, the principles, the ideas to help minimize the risk in both giving and receiving feedback. Excellent. So let me, um, there's a couple of questions that have come in, and I'll, I'll open the, the session here as well. If you have questions, use the question toolbar and send those in. We'll try to address them with Daryl right now. Um, b before we get too far down, I know a lot of people have been asking for the activity codes, so I've hidden them on this slide. If you can find them, you've got them. <laughs> you're, <laughs> so not, you're sneaky. Right above, the, uh, right above the pyramid there, you'll see the HRCI code and the SHRM code, um, and that is a 1Z, as in Ziggy. I V G, so um, I put them in lowercase so you can see the I. Um, but you use those on today's date and enter those in, and you'll get credit for today's um, presentation. It's all free. Uh, so a couple questions. One is, um, uh, what if, in terms of giving feedback, what if you've told this person multiple times already? Right. right. Has the kind of the same conversation right. over again. The behavior's not changing, or they're fully aware of it and yet it continues. Yeah. Wonderful question. Um, Having a good feedback session doesn't necessarily lead to change, not necessarily. Okay. It's a first step. Yeah. Part of the dialogue around uh, understanding why the person did what he or she did is to understand you know, what is driving them behaviorally. There's a whole other area around ability that we haven't really explored. We really have been exploring, I guess, or hinting at their motive or their motivation for doing it. Mm -hmm. But it may well be that the person was taught that way. Uh, it may be that uh, you know socially that those kinds of jokes used to be acceptable where the person used to work or at home they are. So diving down a little bit more into why they did what they did might reveal some some ability barriers mm -hmm. where uh, you've talked about it, you've talked about it, but they may not know what to do differently. They may not have any idea how to do it. They you know there are any number of reasons, but. Uh, it's a good point, and we probably don't have time to go and, and answer that fully, Yeah. but it's a really good question because I know I get that question from people. It's like, I've already talked to them about it, and they don't change. Well, it's either a, a matter of they don't really believe they need to, so you haven't made the case strong enough for change, mm -hmm. or they really don't know how to. Uh, they either other people you know, are getting in their heads, or um, they just don't know how to do it. Um, Another question that's come in is, how do you provide feedback to peers that don't report to you but yeah. work under you? So there's not a yeah. direct relationship. How, you know, so you're not you're not related to me in any way. What are you, know, what, what <laughs> are you doing? Say, right. Wonderful question. I get asked that all the time because now think about the assumption embedded in that. The assumption is that I need to have some sort of authority over you in order to get you to listen to me. Mm -hmm. But what I find is actually that can hamper you. In fact, some really good research shows that. 
the more we use our position power, the less effective we actually are. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, it's actually more helpful to hear it from a peer. One of the things I, I answer to people or ask people when they ask me that question is, well, who would you rather hear this feedback from, your boss or a peer? Mm -hmm. right? It's typically less threatening if you hear it from a peer. So I know the assumption behind that is that, well, I've got no business getting in your business. Yeah, I'm just going to have HR take care of this That's one. Right. That's right. Or I'm going <laughs> to tell your boss. Yeah. But I miss an opportunity um, to give you a safer place to hear it. Uh -huh. I also miss an opportunity for us to build a stronger relationship. And so don't think in terms of power, of authority power. Think in terms of helpfulness power, that I've got information that can help you. And then I don't need any kind of authority. And I can come to you as a peer and talk to you candidly. Yeah, so it just it depends, even if it's a friend or your boss or right. someone like that. Well, I guess the boss is kind of a different conversation. That's, that's it is, another. because you have that other, that power relationship that's different. Um, let's see. Uh, so if the, the conversation starts falling apart and things start getting ugly, um, yeah. what can you say to kind of bring it back on track or kind of rescue the situation? Yeah, another great question, a very real question. Um, this is why it's so crucial to have the right motive going in, right? He has the right to criticize who has a heart to help. If I'm trying to help you, if you're trying to help me, mm -hmm. and I start getting upset about it, what you can do is reaffirm, re-clarify, restate your good intention. That's why good intention is so important, so vital. Because you can say, whoa, wait a minute, Daryl, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not, trying to, I'm not criticizing here, I'm really trying to help. And I thought that this would be useful information. So clarifying once again what your intent really is, and sometimes you do that by telling the person what your intent isn't, which is what they think. They think you know they're being judged, they're being criticized, <clears throat> and you may say something like, "Listen, I'm not I'm not your judge. I'm not here to criticize you. Mm -hmm. I'm really here because I have some ideas that I think would be helpful." So that's you know that's one thing, one way to do it. Hopefully that gets it back on track. If not, remember the Sarah model. Remember that if you know people don't go through that in a matter of you know 12.5 seconds sometimes. So you may say, you know what, uh, this looks like it's just going in the wrong direction. Let's take a little bit of break. Uh, I really don't want, you know, I'm not trying to uh, insult you, I'm not trying to offend you, and it looks like that's what you think I'm trying to do, where we're going with this. That's not. How about if we talk about this again later? Okay. Um, in the moment, they might say, no, I just want to get out of here. And you might say, okay, you know, it appears that things are not going the way I thought they would. Uh, I, I don't want to make this any worse by continuing on, so I'll just let it drop. It, you know, that's in the most extreme case. You just say, okay, okay, I've, I've hit her on nerve. I'm going to stop hitting that nerve and then walk away. Mm -hmm. In your own mind, though, um, well, and to your point earlier, they may go off and process that and then say, okay, actually, he was just trying to help, and actually he had some good ideas. So that person might even come back to you. Sure. If not, then you could go back to them and say, can we talk about this again? Again, I don't want to offend you. But I, do, I don't feel like we've uh, really talked through it anymore. Well, back to the Sarah model, the, when the energy is high, right. uh, typically the, 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 the impetus to change is also greater. Could right? be. So, I mean, yeah. there's, there's a willingness or maybe a, a more effective outcome sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So another question here about, and I don't think we addressed this fully, but um, how do you give feedback to your boss? How does that, change, how does that game change? It's the same thing. Okay. Right. Again, our assumptions behind that about how, why that makes that risky is that, well, this is the person who could fire me. This is the person who could give me lousy assignments, which is true. Mm -hmm. And so this is where you really need to be on your game, but you need to be on your game in terms of you need to be very helpful. And, you know, I talk to managers all the time who wish their people would give them more feedback. I mean, they're not begging for criticism, but they're saying, why don't people tell me this? And this is, uh, it's just almost cliche how long this has happened and how commonly it is, that it's lonely at the top because people won't tell you what they really think. They tell you what they think you want to hear. And I hear managers, leaders bemoaning that dynamic. They're like, I wish people would tell me. Yeah. Because, you know, as brilliant as they are, they only have one brain. They don't have everybody else's brain. They would like to hear. So giving feedback to the boss, it's the same principles. Be helpful. Be clear with your intent. Uh, be open mm -hmm. to what they may have to say. I mean, very often you don't have the full picture. Typically you don't have the full picture. The boss may have be operating based on other information, and so be open to that. Um, another question, have you had success with providing this level of training to professionals who are just starting their careers? So they're not, uh, not in a response to a specific situation, yeah. but just to help them prepare for when the situations arise. Absolutely. In fact, so much so that when I have done this kind of training uh, for people, those who are middle-aged like myself, 
we often say, where was this at the beginning of my career? I wish I knew this in my teen years, you know, in my mm -hmm. 20s. So absolutely. I mean, this is, as long as you are breathing and interacting with other human beings, these principles are going to be helpful in having you know, hard conversations and minimizing the, uh, the defensiveness and the risk. Here's an interesting question. Um, so what if you've tried to give feedback to someone, it didn't go well, um, in fact, in this situation, they're saying that they didn't like the feedback and took you to HR. Right. How do you go about rebuilding the relationship? Yeah. Well, that one depends a bit on the details, but really, once again, it goes back to your intentions. You know, why did you do this? What were you trying to accomplish? Maybe uh -huh. you didn't. Maybe you had your heart in the right place, but your mouth wasn't, and you said some things that were in a, uh, offensive or whatever. Um, I mean, trust is built over time with experience. Yeah. You know, I like Stephen Covey said this years ago that you can't talk yourself out of a problem you've behaved yourself into. Mm -hmm. So if you've done something behaviorally that has offended somebody, then you're going to have to behave yourself back into their good graces. And, and it just takes time. And that starts with, again, affirming, listen, this isn't what I was trying to do. I wasn't trying to criticize or offend you or put you on the spot or embarrass you. I really was trying to help. Apparently that didn't work. And so I'm sorry about it. Mm -hmm. And an apology is a good way to start to turn things around as well. Even though it was their fault in the first place, and they're, <laughs> and they're the ones that were wrong. Yeah, no. well, some people you just can't deal with. <laughs> yeah, in a worst case scenario, also in extremes, you might just say, okay, you know, I burned a bridge, yeah. and I can't rebuild it. Yeah. That's a possibility. It's not likely, though, if you use these skills. Well, Daryl, thank you very much. It was an excellent uh, presentation today. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Again, um, the HRCI codes, I'll send out an email as well with a link to the slides. The slides are on the handout section of the presentation if you haven't received them yet. And the HRCI codes are just above the pyramid here, or the activity codes. Um, but we look forward to having you join us on a future webinar. If you have questions about our training programs in general, please let me know and I can get you some more information. But thanks everybody.